Hello, welcome to Truth Not Tradition online Bible study for February 3rd, 2016. I'm Tony Smario. My father, brother Sal, be joining me remotely from California and posting this on his YouTube channel and brosal.org. So thanks, Dad, and good morning. We've been going through Revelation for 2016. <clears throat> Excuse me, we went through Revelation last year, about just about a year ago. And um, we've, I've learned some things over the year, and um, I feel as if I get more insight every time I read the scripture these days. And, and I think it has to do with what I am always trying to touch on, and I think it's important to reiterate it. A little bit and that is the deeper context the deeper story the deeper pattern that's being woven by all the scripture into a seamless picture seamless vision of something and that something goes all the way back to the story as we receive it coming out of the Garden of Eden Adam and Eve living 900 years in the firmament overhead and watchers and all this sort of thing. A flood and Noah and his family starting over. So, <clears throat> and most of Christianity that I grew up in sort of has it finishing at the second coming of Jesus like that's the culmination that's the finale but the truth is you know if anything it is like in a drama it's the culmination or not the culmination but it's the uh, it's the height of the dramatic action it's the climax of the story but it's not the end of the story it's not the culmination it's not the um, what they call it in storytelling dad uh, the reconciliation of all the elements that were said about at the beginning of the drama so people have I've always been led through revelation by people that were teaching it instructing in it or sharing it in any way that you know, it was leading up to that moment when Jesus would come again. But um, bum, like that's the, that's it. That's the finale. That's the final trumpet. That's the final final, right there, baby. And now it's over because if you're not with Jesus by then, you're going to hell forever. And Christians are going to heaven, and we made it. Race is over. Let's all go home. But of course, when you read the scripture, <clears throat> you know, that's not the end. There's a thousand year kingdom and we're going to come to a point in Revelation when it says the rest of the dead didn't receive their bodies until the thousand years was up. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in detail when we get there, but just <laughs> kind of shows you it's not not the end here they, they who's the rest of the dead what bodies at the end of the thousand years and then it says the devil's let out of the pit which was made to contain him forever but no he's let out for a little season and the result of that being let out and that little season is that this world that's been a thousand years under the rule of you know, the righteous rule, I suppose, of the state of Israel, leading the world with its servants of God, being a blessing to the earth, with the devil chained in the pit so that there was no temptation for a thousand years, no way for the devil to tempt people away from the right thing to do, or however that might be explained or appropriated at the time thousand years 
beating the the uh, swords into plowshares, right? And then what happens as a result of the devil being let out of the pit and the little season, whatever that means, the whole world, they come from across the whole world to surround Jerusalem. So, I mean, you know, come on, what, what's that all about? <laughs> How long does that take at the end of a thousand years of living only with the rule of God? to get to the point where the whole world's going to mount an army or from the, you know, from everywhere around the world is the way it's implied. An army's going to come, a multitude, I believe it says, and surround Jerusalem. So, <clears throat> you know, that takes some explaining. And then you got the raising of Hades and death and every, all the dead that are in the sea and the white throne judgment, the books are opened and the, everything in the lake of fire and then all things are made new again and I saw a new heaven and a new earth and there was no more sea and there were no more tears and there was no more sin what's that got to do with the this Christianity thing that we're all in and this part of history where this end time comes and this Armageddon and Jesus returns in the clouds and every eye sees him and his feet touch the mountain. It splits and hallelujah. And I mean, what's that then? Where, where is that in this larger vision? I mean, how can Christianity imagine it? It's the end, you know? So I think that's the, the real important thing, Dad, that I'm imagining now when I read is that I'm looking at this story where, you know, this is just a part of the story. Christianity and the calling out, the sending of the Messiah to be something that wasn't expected, prophesied to be that way, the, the stumbling block that caused Israel to stumble, that the, that the disobedience of many might be um, <clears throat> uh, stood stood in for is what the word I'm trying to find. It's hard to always to find the right word on the fly. Uh, but that the disobedience of many might be uh, covered by the obedience of the one. So, you know, when you read Paul, when you read through Romans, you get the idea that you know that the Jews were set up to fail and and then I've been seeing it as I've tried to I think um, demonstrate in Romans and, and in the book of uh, in the Gospel of John how it seems to me sort of the human condition that nobody's ever been able to keep you know, I mean, Paul says in Romans, there's none righteous, not one. He quotes the Old Testament that says, you know, all everything they do is rotten and they all run after evil and they they all lie and, you know, there's not one that pleases God. No, not one. So <clears throat> that's been laid down in the word from <clears throat> practically the beginning. You know, isn't that odd? who pleased God, you know, who so few. And, you know, when you, when you look at this picture of, uh, you stand back as sort of a, in a detached or disinterested and just try to pick it apart as a drama. And you think, you know, from Adam and Eve, they didn't please God. And then Cain and Abel, and then down through, you know, all of mankind was so bad that God just, you know, you get this feeling of disgust in in his creation. Not like, oh, I love my children. What do I do to save them? But, eh, kill them all. You know, this is the way the portrayal of it. And as I said last week, I think we in our time have to give a little bit of 
consideration to the fact that what comes to us from thousands of years ago contains the, that element of legend and myth that allows it to be transferable so that the story could remain the same and didn't have to do with time and place and particulars uh, of, of anything. It's a, a narrative that continues on down through history and it sounds easy because it's already there. But I think about that sometimes and why some literature professors insist that the scriptures have a very important role in literature for the simple reason that they represent the most ancient, uh, you know, the oldest standing cohesive narrative known to humankind. Even if they're just a fabricated story, they're, they're the oldest fabricated story. And they're a single narrative. And this narrative is, traces this people like some, some mega saga on the television that runs endlessly week after week. And so, you know, it's within this context that when you stand back, it goes all the, it reaches back into the mists of time where we talk about a firmament above the heavens. We talk about um, Enoch walking and talking with God. We talk about a burning bush and we talk about people living to be, you know, 900 years old. So it's, it's kind of removed from our capacity to, to really, you know, feel it for our, ourselves in, in the sense of believing it as concrete. I mean, you could say that's what faith is, but faith isn't believing the unbelievable. Faith is acting on the thing that you can believe, you know? And so can I believe Jesus came out of the grave? Well, yeah, if I can believe there's a God that made everything, well, why not? So can I believe people live 900 years? Sure I can. I'm just saying that I don't feel like putting the story into into strictly materialistic terms uh, satisfies the deeper vision of God's purpose. Because when you get to Revelation and you get to everything we're talking about right now with the what I consider the misunderstanding of Christianity, you know, we're not at the end these end times are the end of history. They're the end of something. But they're not the end of creation. They're not the end of existence. They're not even the end of sin and life and death. Because the rest of the dead didn't get their bodies back till the thousand years had ended. Huh? You know? What do they get bodies back for at the end of the thousand years? And then the devil's let out for a little season. And what happens during that time besides the fact that a multitude or, you know, result that come and surround Jerusalem to go after the Jews to turn against God, as it were, in this grand story that starts with God creating these people in a garden way back at the beginning. So I'm saying we don't understand that end very well, do we? About this little season and and this, you know, this, this whatever's going to happen after this Christian time of these churches that we're in, this time that's at hand. As I started this study, this time of Revelation 2016, you know, how do you reconcile the fact that 2,000 years ago, these were, guys were talking about the time is at hand. Well, not exactly, but if you look at it on something that's maybe 100,000 years long or 50,000 years long, and, and, and maybe there's three or four or five or, you know, cycles in which civilizations exist under God and are somehow terminated and start again and 
terminate it and start again. And we're in one of those now. You know, if you can bring your mind back that big, I say our Christian scripture allows for that kind of consideration. You know, we got this whole Hades, this place of abode for the dead. We got the record of Jesus going there while he was in the grave to preach to spirits and then take captivity captive to himself. You know, we got the vi visions of Enoch and all the places. You get these watchers, these sons of God that fall. I mean, you know, you, you got a lot of evidence of many levels and many things going on. It's not real hard to consider that that there's if not many incarnations of the same soul in the way some people understand it and some Christians reject it, at least creations by what Christians certainly would have to call the same God, many creations by the same God or many parts of creation where it cycles again and again. And this is where I was trying to get to is that it seems quite natural to me that nobody seems to be able to follow God, whether it's the Jews that are led by the hand, led by the miracles, led through the Red Sea, given the temple by Moses, you know, just given it by the mouth of God himself. And what do they do? Kill the prophets. What do they do? go off and become a whore, the, the house of Israel, get divorced and scattered. And God says, you whore, you'll, you'll, you'll go with anybody but me. Right? So, you know, why would the Christian, you know, what makes the Christians immune? Just because you know, Jesus is Jesus. The Jews know Jehovah's Jehovah. They've just lost track of following them and they follow a bunch of traditions instead. They follow a Talmudic set of traditions that Jesus said, you make void God's word by your tradition. So anyway, I, you know, I want to keep leading with that because otherwise you, you know, you just listen to me, read the word so you can get the same traditional understanding out of it. Jesus is opening up seals to punish everybody, send everybody to hell because it's time to end it all. God coming back, save the Christians, take them to heaven, kill everybody else, send them to hell. Come on, let's get this lake of fire. Yeah, we got a little season, bing, bang, bang. Let's get it over with. I mean, come on. You got a thousand years. Then the rest of the dead receive their bodies, whatever that means. When the thousand years are ended, the devil's loosed from his confinement whatever that means, right? How many people have their mind around all that? Like you just know what that's going to look like in reality, what that means to either the physical representation, meaning our flesh and blood in the world of breathing, living beings, or in the spiritual world of souls and Hades and afterlife and sons of God and devils and angels. I mean, come on, who knows from that stuff? What do, what do we know? That's why Jesus is the, you know, that's what, you know, for me, you see the need for this manifestation of God, some focal point, some compass point that, you know, like, boom, that's the center. That's God. That's why I say, you've seen me, you've seen the father. Show, you tell me, show, show you God, show, show us the father, just show us, you know, rabbi, we see you healing people. We see you're something special. So yes, yeah, show us who is God. Cause remember back then people believed in God, but they had different gods, right? Remember the argument with Jonah when the boat, Hey, find out who, you know, whose gods he believe in somebody, everybody pray to your God. See if we can get this storm to stop. Because everybody believed in supernatural reality. They had different names or expressions. 
you know, my God's the one that lives in the sea and, you know, my God's the one that lives at the top of the mountain or in the sky or, you know, whatever. So when you think of this now manifestation of a man, a human being, son of man, that as John says in the beginning of Revelation, became known as the Son of God when he was through power, when he was raised from the dead. See, so this was just, you know, a man by the account of any Pharisee that had him killed. He's gone. He ain't no Messiah. He was a man. He's dead. See, but this group of people Claim and experience. No, we saw him. I mean, he, ra he, he raised, for God raised this man from the dead. And that's the stumbling block, see? No Jew was expecting that. No Greek was expecting That's the foolishness to the Greeks. What? Huh? The God was a, a man, but the man died like a man, but then raised again, but back to a man. You know, that's none of that fit anybody's metaphysic from out of the ancient world. And it didn't fit the Jewish expectation out of the, what they thought was their interpretation of the Mosaic Covenant. See, that's the big rub in all this. And if you don't keep that in mind, you just see it as people are sinners. Then where's, where's all that? Where's your condemnation for sin? We, we're in the... We finished 11 chapters of Revelation. We're halfway through the book of Revelation. I haven't read nothing about punishment for sin. All these sinners now, they're going to get their retribution for sin. You know, where where's all that come from in Christianity? You know? And, and it's because nobody really reads it or studies it. And that's why, sorry, Dad, to be taking a little extra long prologue this week but uh, you know I, I i feel like hey this is all for the future we've only got 20 people that that listen week to week and and i appreciate it and i'm you know for you guys i'm sorry if it's a little extra that you don't need to hear but i i feel like there's always the potential that this is going to get out to people and and we're leaving a record and i i just want to keep breaking it down because I was rereading a little bit and reading on into this week's, you know, chapters 12 and 13 and the woman clothed with the sun. And I just want to quickly uh, start with where we were last week in chapter 11 and the seventh angel sounded. And now that's right after uh, these two witnesses that are part of this second woe. They're terrorizing the earth for three and a half years. Not necessarily terrorizing, but they're able to stop from the rain, turn the sea to blood, call fire, uh, call plagues out whenever they want. And it's bad enough, at least, that the world rejoices when they're killed. <clears throat> they lay in the streets for three and a half days, and then the people that are watching them watch them raise the spirit of God, it says, goes in them. They raise from the dead and they go off in a cloud. People see it and their enemies even see it. And it, at that same hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth part of the city fell. So, uh, and the survivors gave glory to God. Passed, and behold, the third woe comes quickly. Verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there was great rumblings, thunders, sayings. And I'm arguing, and I, and I feel even more strongly as I've reread it, that, that that second woe and the third woe coming quick, quickly is right at the end there. That's that sixth seal time woe when everybody's going to be praying for the rocks to hide him from the face of him who sits on the throne. They're right at that last woe when there's nowhere left to go. 
because the king's about to take over, which is, and we've seen pictures of that, right? Because that's what ushers in this millennial kingdom of his throne being set in place. But now verse 15, because remember we were told back at chapter 10, verse 7, in the days of the voice of the Son, he shall begin to sound. For your God will be fulfilled as he has proclaimed to his servants, the prophets. So, and again, I keep saying that includes this restoration of Israel. It includes the day when he'll wipe away every tear from their eye. It includes all of this future restoration. When he'll marry them and they'll be his bride and they'll serve him the way he he meant them too. So this is all post seven year covenant. It's what I'm trying to relate it to now in our reading of Revelation. When the seventh angel begins to sound, it's got a seven year covenant. And yet still, don't, because for Christians, I remember I would have said, well, but wait a minute, post seven year covenant, that's heaven. That's it. That's over. That's the end. No, it's not, Christians. It's either in the thousand-year millennial kingdom or it's in the little season, which I keep arguing will be many thousands of years. Or it's in the time of the white throne judgment, which I don't know what kind of time frame, you know, what that entails. Is that a moment? Is that a twinkling of an eye that everyone erased and judged? The sea gives up its dead. Hades gives up its dead. And all this, you know, is that all happen just in the, what we would, you know, call just the flash? Is that a, is, are, are those events for us? I mean, you know, how do we know? But a thousand year millennial kingdom, you know, that's pretty clear, pretty clearly outlined as something that takes a thousand years to complete. Okay. So, I just want to keep the, you know, the conversation going. And if you don't have to talk, you know, get the question, at least on the record, so the future people that might look at this can say, hey, look, here's somebody that brought up the right question at the right time. How come Tony doesn't address this or that? I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm just reading this, giving you my interpretation, studying it for what it says to find it for myself. And hoping it's a benefit now in doing that from the 15th verse on you got the seventh angel sounding now and kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever there's no will become it's about to happen they have become so again it sounds like we've we've gotten through at least at the end of the seven-year covenant, okay? But now when we read on further, four and 20 elders sat on the throne and their seats fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks to thee, O Lord God Almighty, who is and was, because thou hast taken to thyself thy great power and hast reigned. Now, interesting, it started in the beginning, Dad, of Revelation, thou who is and was and is to come. You know, I mean, is it just me or is that been left off here, John? Right? <laughs> Saying we give thanks to thee, O Lord God Almighty, who is and was. I mean, where's the is to come? Right? Because he's, he's come. It just says that. It just says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So there's no more is to, to come at this point. So this is when his kingdom has come. Remember our father who is in heaven, whose will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, thy kingdom come. Well, it sounds like this is the time when his kingdoms come. You know, what we're asking is that, is that at the beginning of the thousand years? Or is that at the end of the white throne judgment when the tabernacle comes to the earth? Right? 
sounds like here it's at the end of the in the th at the beginning of a thousand years when he reigns forever and ever but what about the little season see but that doesn't stop his reign apparently I mean in that sense he's never stopped reigning though so how do we see how do we divide all that in our minds what do we call his reign forever and ever okay so here's to me what some of the clue is Verse 18 of chapter 11, and the nations were angry and thy wrath has come. The, your wrath has come, not is to come, not, you know, it has come. Your wrath has come and the nations were angry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be. See, the time of the dead, see, because there's, there's going to be a future time where there won't be death, right? hell death hades they're all thrown in the lake of fire in this book of revelation right I, i'm trying to stick to this grand vision all the way from adam to new creation new heaven new earth no more death right that's all part of the vision so as i said last week and keep saying where are we where where does each of these particular parts of the scripture where are we in all of this grand vision because what i'm starting to see is the seven year period isn't the only thing being shown by this book of revelation or or that's what i'm presenting is my newest insight dad is that for me i'm starting to say well wait a minute some of this stuff sounds like it's taken me to the place that some of the you know when it says wait white throne judgment when it says little season at the end of the thousand years the rest of the dead were given their bodies well we know that's post seven year covenant so this whole revelation isn't just describing the apocalypse so-called it's the things hereafter all the way to the very end right new heaven new earth no more death so we have to ask ourselves what part of that whole vision is does any of this relate to just like Daniel 10 and 11 tell the story that goes all the way back to the battles of the king of the north and the king of the south from the first Seleucids and Ptolemies all the way and then it comes to finally where it talks about this last king that will do battle with the king of kings right and be defeated that will take on the saints that will exalt himself above everything see so we know that somewhere in there we we get to the king of the future that hasn't even come yet but where you know where in that area is he still talking about going back to that you know first century and where has he gone on you know where is it pushed us into the future and i want to do daniel i think next dad after revelation and talk about all that but uh anyway I, i'm just saying i think in revelation this is a very important subject and why I want to keep spending time with it, that look at the whole vision, Christians, from Adam all the way to new heaven, new earth, no sin, no devil, no punishment, no condemnation, no Christians, no believers and non-believers. And yet there's a whole thousand-year millennium there's a whole resurrection of the rest of the dead after that. A whole letting out of the devil and a, and a little season, which I argue is thousands of years. A whole surrounding of Jerusalem by a multitude that turned from God again. A whole reconciliation of that fall. Who led, who led them astray? The devil. Okay, who is there? Uh, you know, do they have a Messiah after the thousand years now? Does Jesus die again? Right? They, everybody knows Jesus after a thousand years now. What happens to, you see what I mean? 
There's a whole story we don't know. And I'm saying maybe that's what the seven thunders were saying. Because chapter 9 ends with, after this smoke that kills a third part of man, this first woe, the people didn't repent. And chapter 10 sees this mighty angel that comes down. It's like an interlude that says, you know, this is this mighty angel, the one that's got the cl clothed with the cloud and the rainbow and has the little book that he that that uh, John eats. That weird little interlude where the thunder speak and John said, I was about to write, but a voice from heaven said, don't write what they said. Seal it up. I mean, uh, isn't that kind of interesting? Because then what this angel goes on, gives him the book and says, you're going to prophesy again about many nations and peoples. Now, I say this could be after the millennial kingdom. And the seven thunders are about the prophecies or the, you know, the way in which that whole thing's going to come to its reconciliation because it's all part of this reconciliation spoken of in Revelation. The revelation doesn't just end with Jesus coming at the end of the seven years. So you've got to place all of this in there. And I'm not saying which comes within, which comes without. I'm presenting this idea that we need to read it that way. And, that, and the reason I'm prefacing all this is because now as we get to uh, chapter 12, what's called chapter 12, we get this great sign that's seen in heaven. So I want to present the perhaps if I was going to uh, present this book to someone, if I, if I was going to recopy it down again, I would want to draw a line between the 14th and 15th verse here in the 11th chapter and, and say that that's where my chapter break is. After these two witnesses are presented to us and then they're killed and then this earthquake and then 7,000 and woe, the, the second woe is passed. That's been the whole thought, these woes. And behold, the third woe comes quickly. But now this next sentence and the seventh angel sounded, that's not the third woe like we talked about last week. That's another thought now. Let's say that starts for me. I break the chapter there. And the seventh angel sounded and there was great rumblings. Now this takes you way forward because he already told you in the days when the seventh angel prepares to sound, the mystery of God will be revealed. So he shows you this second woe and then he says, you know, behold, the third woe is coming quickly. But this isn't the third woe. This is a vision of something that takes you to the time of the seventh angel when the mystery of God's fulfilled. And I say that that, that can be seen in this 18th and 19th verse. And the reason I keep staying here, Dad, is because this bleeds into what is broken today for our Bibles into this 12th chapter as if the, as if and a great sign was seen in heaven is the new chapter thought and I say well wait a minute let's break it up here at the 14th verse and the second woe is passed and behold the third woe comes quickly end of thought chapter break you're waiting for the third woe after this stuff, people, and it's coming quickly. So when you see all this stuff happen, by the time you get to these horsemen that have killed a third part of men and by the fire and smoke and brimstone coming out of their mouth, you've seen the, the mountain that looked like it was on fire thrown into the sea, a third part of the ships are killed, destroyed, third part of the ocean, everything in it third part in it's destroyed you've seen all that right now you've seen the first woe and now then there'll be this thing with these two witnesses and at the end of that they're going to be killed and then there's going to be a great earthquake and seven thousand will die because of the earthquake in the city and 
but you'll see these people raised to life and that's the second woe and hey the third woe is coming right after that end of thought chapter break now new chapter and the seventh angel sounded right okay and they'll into the 18th verse and the nations were angry and thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and to reward thy servants and prophets and the saints and those who revere thy name small and great and to destroy those who cor corrupt the earth is that at the end of the seven year period dad that that's happening to reward the servants and the prophets and the saints and both small and great and destroy those who corrupt the earth because what about the rest of the dead didn't get their bodies back till the thousand years were ended they're in Hades so they can't be I mean you know that the rewards can't be taking place then that's this sounds to me more like picture of what we call white throne judgment you know, an, a, an, a, an early vision of what we're going to see again in this book when it talks about Hades were called up and the sea gave up its dead, the books were opened, and right? Because those who corrupt the earth, who are they? Men? I mean, it makes me think of Moses and the idea of the watchers that led men astray. Those are the one Enoch holds responsible. It says that's what hell and these bottomless pits were created for to throw those watchers into. That's where they're going to go so that they can't escape anymore or be held in containment when that is the appropriate uh, vision. Uh, so that's what it looks like to me, Dad, right? And it, what does it follow with the 19th verse as we finished last week? And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Covenant. Where'd that come from? You know, why is that in the temple of God in heaven at this point? And not in the temple in Jerusalem, you know, where the nations are coming to be blessed. You see? And there were lightnings and thunderings and voices and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Now, to me, you know, could that be a picture like the new beginning? This is like after the white throne judgment, <laughs> temple of God, you know, open in heaven and this, you know, new beginning now. Ark of the Covenant, strangely enough, that symbol of the covering you know, the, the righteousness that redeemed everybody, that covered everybody. So anyway, and a great sign was seen in heaven. See, that I'm trying to place all this, Dad, because traditionally I think it's taken completely out of context. And I'm not sure. You know, I, I'm trying to throw just a, a fresh light on it for myself because I'm seeing it this way. You know, what's this all mean? And a great sign was seen in heaven, and a woman, a woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, again, it, it seems like a break, like the way they have this chapter break, that's fine. This thought about the angel sounding, the seventh angel sounding, just this cameo vision of that future time that's going to be spoken about again when it talks about the books being opened, the sea giving up its dead. I mean, all of these things in Revelation are all visions of the whole thing of the time hereafter, after the times of the church age, which is the thing that's at hand now. That's why it can be seen at hand because the stuff after this goes way after this, baby all the way into the millennial kingdom, all the way after that into the to the little season, all the way after that to the white throne judgment, all the way after that to when the throne of heaven comes down. The tabernacle of God comes to exist with men, right? So how many thousands of years is that after the time of the church? 
see, which is at hand now and has been for the last 2,000 years. See, that's what's coming to an end. And that's why Jesus is like, yeah, let me get, you know, here's what's going to take place after these things. See, and so this seven year covenant and this Armageddon and all that, that's just sort of now, if you think about it that way, the beginning of this, how it transitions into all these things that are going to take place after these things. A new, you know, a new beginning, a new, a new millennium. And then after that, the, the rest of the dead get their bodies. And then after that, the, the devil's let out and the thousand, you know, and then a little season of however long that is. And then after that, a white throne judgment. And after that, the death and Hades, you know, thrown in the grave and a new heaven, a new earth, no sea, no death, no devil. I mean, come on. How does that relate to everything we consider now as life and creation and existence and purpose and meaning. It's all meaningless in, in a concept of a devilless, temptationless, sinless, hellless, deathless, you know, future. So, you know, we're living through something to that. And Revelation now appears to be having elements that deal all the way through to there since it speaks of. It's, it's the place we get our vision of this new heaven, new earth, tabernacle coming down. You know, I saw there were no more seas and right. You get some of that with Enoch. Funny enough, like I always say, it's the, the correlations just undeniable. John knows Enoch. There's no doubt in my mind that John knows Enoch since we know that what we call the book of Enoch was written pre-John. You know, that it, it dates back to the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls at least, at least a couple of hundred years before the time of John, probably 300 years or more at, you know, it, it, at least that far. So, uh, the book of Enoch can't be some pseudo revelation plagiarizing these images. It can only be the other way around. So if revelation is real, if Jesus Christ is the source of these revelations, and it's interesting how that sort of, uh, you know, vision that takes you all the way through to a new creation, right? So what are we looking at in here, guys, Christians, dad? It's not just... Jesus throwing down punishments is his, his 21 great punishments that he's going to throw down seals and trumpets and vials. And when he's done with that, he can wash his hands of the world of sin and all you non-believers and, and Muslim sinners. And we can Christians can go to heaven and we can start over and the rest of you can just burn in hell forever. I mean, come on. That's, that's not the story that's in here. So, okay, here we go. I'm just trying to open up the questions. You know, when is this? Seems to me there should be a break here. 15th verse of the 11th chapter, seventh angel sounds takes us to the time of possibly the white throne judgment and the new beginning. And a great sign was seen in heaven. Is this at the time of the new beginning? I think what it's doing is throwing us back again into a cameo picture of the whole thing. Like the way the first four seals show us the whole apocalypse in four seals, white horse, red horse, black horse, green horse, peace or righteousness, war, de famine, death, and the grave. That's how the Apocalypse will unfold. So now this gives us from this great sign was seen in heaven. Because remember, all this has taken place in heaven. John's in heaven. This is a vision like Enoch, like Ezekiel. Okay. Great sign was seen in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another sign in heaven. And behold, there was a great fiery dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. 
and his tail cut off a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered so as to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a male child who was to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, we have a, a friend, uh, so, uh, someone, an acquaintance through the ministry over many years who's uh, looked at it from a point of view of the astrological implications of Revelation. And all these things have astrological implications. And indeed, the Jews have their own, uh, what's that called, that slips my mind at the moment, the name of their own astrological understanding of how all the stars and the, the alignment of the constellations and such ha have their particular meaning as far as we know. Um the Jews have a whole astrology. The name just slips my mind at the moment. But anyway, the, we have a, uh, an acquaintance through the ministry for who years, who's been painting the end time vision in, in a completely astrological understanding. And I say, okay, perhaps all these things have to do with the movement of stars in the same way the three wise, the, the wise men the men of the east you know they were stargazers they knew by the movement of stars when something had happened i say there's still some you know mystery there in the astrology we don't understand but it had to do with and people can take us back with the programs like our friend and show you the kind of things that they might have been seeing in the sky at that time that let them know something had happened. And so if all of this has that sort of portent, uh, a woman in the uh, clothed with the sun is, is a, like a constellation. And it's got to do with the vantage point of the sun and the moon and stars on this woman's head. Fine. I say there's another thing we have to look at here, and it's got to do with what I just read. At the fifth verse, she brought forth a male child who was to be shepherd, who was to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. Okay, that's that brings it down to earth, out of the heavens. This male child, whether that's something that is appearing in the sky as a constellation or as a starry symbol, it, it, it's brought in the prophecy right to earth was to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God. So I, I believe that, you know, that if it can be shown that all these starry symbols have some pattern that can be demonstrated to be happening in the sky, I, I still don't think that's the limit. I think it would be wrong to limit our um, our view of it as that or to think that that's what it was written to mean. I think that you can see right here, I, I think what it means is it's, a, it's a, a picture of the whole thing like in Genesis when it says that the, the serpent would bite the heel of of the woman and the heel of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. You know, that sort of sums up this whole, you know, what was going to manifest into this material world, right? This spiritual serpent now, this evil was going to result in the, uh, a crippling, if you will, of this human race. But the seed of this woman was going to crush that, that crippling power. And, and so this whole thing is playing out that very short vision that was laid down back in Genesis. So imagine that this is sort of a similar vision now. A great sign seen in heaven. Woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. Okay. Twelve, crown of twelve stars. Right? The 12 stars would seem to be the patriarchs. The woman would seem to be the house of Israel. 
clothed in the sun. The sun's sort of the ancient symbol of God, right? So this is God's expression in the earth, let's say. And she being with child, right? She's going to manifest something, this expression, right? And most people, most people interpret it this far, that this male child is, is the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus. She brought forth a male child who was to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, that they should feed her a thousand and two hundred and three score days. Now that brings in this three and a half years again, which ties us into Daniel, ties us into what we just read last week with the, the three and a half years with the two witnesses. And it brings this vision sort of from front to back, all the way from the woman herself, the, the creation, say, of the house of Israel by God. She'd be laboring in pain, She's the one that's going to bring forth this child that's good, this one that's going to shepherd the nations. Uh, and because of this element, this devil that's looking forth to devour that child when it's born, uh, she flees into the wilderness a place prepared for for three and a half years, which takes us now, we know, to the end of the story. That's that last three and a half years before her final redemption, this house of Israel, if that's what this symbol means. That's what I'm sort of thinking it means. Verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Now again, Christianity puts this in some sort of chronological, like, after this woman thing, after this child thing, uh, I say, no, wait a minute. These are short pictures, and they're all about the same length, if you look at it, from the 15th verse of the 11th chapter, and the seventh angel sounded, when it seems to me like we're taken all the way to the end of the story, just as John was told, in the days that that angel begins to sound, the mystery of God will be accomplished. There'd be no, you know, no more reckoning of time, right? It's no more of this waiting for a day and an hour and a year to come. The mystery of God will be accomplished, right? How, how do we reconcile that with just being at the end of the seven-year covenant? when we've still got all these predictions from Revelation about the rest of the dead after the thousand years, the little season, the, you know, all these things I've been talking about. So anyway, so I'm presenting that these thoughts, 15th verse to the end of the, what we call the 11th chapter is a thought in itself. Then this, tw then this great sign appears in heaven that carries us through just to the sixth verse. And there was war in heaven. Now this is another vision of all this. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. See, this isn't after the woman flees into the desert. This isn't after these events. This is taking us back into a look at it now. Because the woman flees into the desert for three and a half years. That's the last, that's the last it's the final redemption. Okay, so verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but did not prevail. Neither was their place found any longer in heaven. Thus the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out on the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the deliverance and the power and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has been accomplished. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night is cast down. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not spare themselves even to death. 
Christians. Yeah, and again, it's funny whenever they, whenever the Bible refers to Christians, it's always suffering, giving themselves, giving their head, loving their brother, claiming nothing as their own, turning their cheek, not you know, don't hold, don't hold anything against your enemies. You know, people that accuse you or right people that uh, persecute you. <laughs> so. Uh, And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. Who? For the accuser of our brethren. So it's the brethren. See? See, so how's that? Where are they? How is this? How's the brethren there? And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not spare themselves even to death. And I'm saying that's probably the brethren, the rest of these dead that are being waiting for under the altar, the souls of the dead, and you know, all of the Jewish brethren that die in the true Messiah. Because that's that brethren, you know, that, hey, this is our Messiah. He came. Jews, fellow Jews, our Messiah came. Paul later gets the message, hey, you know what? That... God claimed he was going to give it to people that didn't ask for it. God said he was going to, you know, he'll make you jealous by a people that wasn't his people and all this. And Paul sees the whole aha moment. But the brethren, the whole idea of this thing was that, hey, our Messiah we've been waiting for is here. He came. It was that Jesus. He really was the Messiah. And the Jews saying, wait, hey, you got to stop saying that. You can't claim him as Messiah. And they had to go to death for that by from people like Paul in the beginning. If, he, if you got caught, you got to stop saying that. We can't stop saying that. You have to stop saying that. We'll stone you, right? This is who, these are these brethren that suffered for his name. And there's going to be people that suffer like that again. And it's going to happen in this seven year. Uh, King, you know, probably the last three and a half years is the time frame that this wrath of God time when they're claiming a false Messiah. And the people that are saying, no, the, the Jews over there, they're saying, no, it's Jesus. Jesus is our Messiah. Don't go with this, this false Messiah that's giving us back our temple. That's not the Messiah. They're going to be persecuted again. So anyway, that's who I'm thinking perhaps fulfills this. And, and, you know, and so when is this? They're already there. It's over by this time. When the, when the devil's cast out of heaven. See, so when is this? And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. And by the way, see, the lamb, that's who was slain for Mo, in, in Moses' time, right? It's the lamb whose blood's put on the post of the door. That's who they don't realize Jesus is. He's your lamb that you've been worshiping every year for your entire existence. And they've conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not spare themselves even to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devils come down to you. And his wrath is great because he knows that his time is short. And that when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth... He pursued the woman who had given birth to a son. See, that doesn't have to be, <clears throat> excuse me, dad. The, the, that just it puts the, the characters in place. He pursued the woman. That doesn't mean after this moment that was described before here, the woman that fled to the wilderness. That's not concurrent to that. Because the woman flees to the wilderness at the very end, to the place that's prepared for her. He goes after the woman that had had the son. He, you know, she had the son 2,000 years ago. But she's still the house of Israel. See? 
So, and when the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to a son. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly from the presence of the serpent to the wilderness into her place where she would be nourished for years and months and days. Now, isn't that just him reflecting back on what he just said? And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God. Remember this whole thought. And a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, 12 stars on her head. And there was war in heaven. Michael fought against the dragon, but did not pre prevail. And the dragon saw he was cast to earth, and he pursued the woman who had given birth to a son. See, we're still in the same thought. This, that's this woman clothed with the sun, right? So this is just a throwback to this vision and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. And that sounds like an airplane. I mean, how would John have, what, what would the vision look like to someone who'd never seen an airplane 2,000 years ago? And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly from the presence of the serpent. Then the serpent sent a flood water out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the water which the dragon had spouted out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged at the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so the rest of the woman's children, house of Israel, right? These are the Jews that have the testimony of Jesus. That's what I'm going to keep presenting here. We're talking last three and a half years here. We're talking, this is a vision of that time that's predicted when the Jews, when, when Israel will be conquered and the Jews will be put to the sword. And that's what we're seeing in this chapter 12 vision. This woman clothed with the sun is, is but John's vision of the house of Israel from that dimension or that vantage point in which he's seeing these visions. I doubt that it follows in any kind of time frame on the 19th verse of the 11th chapter when the temple of God opened. And the, No, I, I think it's a, a vision now all to itself. A sign was seen in heaven, this house of Israel. This is how all of this is accomplished. House of Israel clothed with the sun. God's, you know, creation, if you will. God's doing. And this dragon that wants to devour this child that's caught up to God. I mean, you know, this sort of sums up this play that's going on from the beginning, the middle, child's born caught up to God dragon pursues the woman woman goes to a desert on wings of great you know the look to John like great eagle okay that takes us watching this through to this seven-year covenant period time and through to this final time of history we call the end times right and now into what we call the 13th chapter but I'm just pointing out I think it's Jews we're talking about here, not Christians. Make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And as I stood on the stand of the shore, and as I stood on the sand of the shore, I saw a wild beast rise up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads blasphemous words. And the wild beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his throne, and great authority. And one of his heads was as though mortally wounded. But his deadly wound was healed, 
and all the world wondered about the wild beast. And they worshipped the dragon, because he had given power to the wild beast, saying, Who can prevail against him to fight him? Now, wild beast is like animal again. Beast, living one. These words translated, this is just similar to the the beasts that were around the throne. God, these wild animals. Now this one, with the seven heads that have blasphemous names on it, has ten horns and crowns on its horns. Now horns usually mean you know kingdom or ruler. Crowns then meaning rulership, right? A crown, like a king has a crown. So the horns could be kingdoms and the crowns could be kings, or the horns could be kings. It denotes ten of them. Seven heads on this beast, this wild beast. One of the heads on this beast looks like it's been mortally wounded, but its wound is healed, which reminds me of what we read earlier about the lamb slain that looked at it, it looked as it had it been slain, right? Because the lambs had their throats cut, so it looks like a lamb with its throat cut, but it's obviously alive. This is a wild beast that has seven heads. One of the heads looks like it's been mortally wounded, but its wounds been healed. Now, the beast I saw was like a leopard, feet were like that of a bear, mouth like a mouth of a lion. Now, it's unmistakable, again, that John, who quotes Daniel earlier, when he starts this whole thing, behold, it'll come in the clouds and every eye will see him. That's out of Daniel. Well, Daniel envisions, in, in Daniel's vision, he sees a, a lion, a beast that's like a lion, a beast that's like a leopard, a beast that's like a bear, right? The lion's Babylon and the bear's Medo-Persia and the leopard is Grisha. So it's impossible not to, you know, consider these in that light for me. Now remember, this is a beast, so that looks like to me three of those seven heads, perhaps, because this beast has seven heads, the whole beast. People are going to come to see real quick how, and I think the mistake, how Christianity sees this beast as the Antichrist. But this beast is not the Antichrist. This beast is the supernatural force that has seven heads. Seven heads. Ten horns. Ten kings or kingdoms. Or rulers even. Kings probably which also makes us think of the Daniel prophecy of the ten-toed kingdom or the ten horns that come out of the fourth beast that was different from all the others and the little horn that rises up among it. This beast has ten horns. Crowns are on the horns, which means those horns represent kings or kingdoms. But the heads are the, head, are the beasts. They represent, say, the characters or the characteristics of the beast itself. Now, that beast is not a person, a king. Okay? So now let's look at that. The beast is like a, a leopard, a bear, a, a, a lion. Okay, these in Daniel were you know, different kingdoms. The lion was Babylon, the bear was Medo-Persia, the leopard is Grisha. So let's just think, let's let's read on for a minute and then I'll, I'll go back. This is 
you know, this is the deeper stuff and there's a lot of traditional understanding that's both valid and I think a lot of misunderstood stuff. So let's just take a little at a time. And the wild beast was like a leopard, feet like the feet of a bear, mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, this beast, and his throne and great authority. And one of his heads was as though mortally wounded, but his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered about the wild beast. And they worshipped the dragon because he had given power to the wild beast, saying, who can prevail against him to fight him? So I think there's a clue here. The world didn't worship the wild beast. They worshipped, you know, or the head that was wounded. They worshipped the dragon because he'd given power to the wild beast, this animal, which is a leopard. It looks like a leopard, a bear, a seven-headed thing, okay? Not a man, not a ruler, I don't think. But let's keep looking into it. But I think this is a clue. They worshiped the dragon because he given power to this wild beast, saying, who can pre prevail against him to fight him? So what is this beast that you can't beat this beast? It's starting to sound like this Babylon kingdom that ends in a day. This great kingdom, right? It's a, starting to sound to me like this, you know, this final empire, this great empire like Rome, this fourth empire that rules all the world, which is just a head of this seven heads in, in the vision we're looking at now. Rome isn't included, but Rome would be another of the heads uh, of this seven-headed beast, right? Because uh, when you look at all the, as we've taught before on Revelation, and I don't have much time to get off on the track right now, but the nations that ruled that territory and, and oppressed Israel, or that you might even say that the house of Israel fornicated with, was... Egypt and Assyria before Babylon, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, then the Romans, then there's a kingdom after Rome, and we're not to that part of the Revelation prophecy just yet, but when you add all those up, it comes to seven funny enough okay and it includes the leopard bear lion kingdoms that relate to daniel's prophecy so it keeps all the sort of the strip the you know the circles closed without having to go invent ways for modern kingdoms or some different way that things can fit into this prophecy because of course you've if you're willing to take it out of some context, some common denominator, then you could make France or Spain or England or any number of kingdoms be the right kingdoms in your end time scenario. But if you understand that Daniel has to, you know, everything has to key on Daniel's vision of it and this abomination and this seven year covenant and this ten horns and the little horn that uproots three and the you know this fourth kingdom this roman empire and right the nebuchadnezzar image that goes from the head of gold to the feet of iron and clay because in the days of these toes kingdoms of iron and clay the god of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never end so you know for all these end time moments when we're talking about the kingdom that shall never end, you know, those all come together somehow. Those threads come together. So now here in this 13th chapter, 
And they worshipped the dragon because he'd given power to the wild beast, saying, Who can prevail against him to fight him? And there was given to him a mouth that he should utter boastful things and blasphemies. And power was given to him to make war for forty and two months. Here we are again with this three and a half years. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God. See, who is this? And his dwelling place and those who dwell in heaven. And power was given to him over every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay, so this is when, this is obviously a picture of when Jerusalem's falling, isn't it? Give him power over the saints. And so this is toward the end of the three and a half years, that moment we just read about. And all who dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Even those whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, so you know, who is this now? And the wild beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And one of his heads was though mortally wounded, but his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered about the wild beast. And they worshipped the dragon because he'd given power to the wild beast, saying, Who can prevail against him to fight him? And there was given to him a mouth that he might utter boastful things. See, and there was given to him, who? The wild beast, a mouth? The seven-headed beast was given a mouth that he might utter boastful things? Right? I mean, who else can it be? And blasphemies and power was given to him, the wild beast with the seven heads, to make war for forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling place and those who dwell in heaven. See, because this is a vision in heaven, this wild beast, right? And power was given to him, this wild beast with the seven heads over every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation. It was given to him, this wild beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And, though, and all who dwell on the earth shall worship him, this wild beast, with the seven heads, even those whose names are not written in the book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man has ears, let him hear. So, you know, I'm presenting that we're not talking about a man here, this he this him, this is the wild beast with the seven heads, one of which looks wounded to death like the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Do you think people are going to see a lamb? Only if you see through that veil, that curtain of dimension and see what John saw or see something Ezekiel or Enoch or, you know, only if you see through to that other side do you see something that represents that way. So this beast is what it looks like from that side. That's who's making war. See, I say the dual imagery is that the ten horns represent these kings with the crowns. Unless from that side, that also represents something of rulership that comes down through this beast. You know, I, I'm not sure. There's more in Revelation to get out of the the false prof prophet and the, the beast that we call the Antichrist and, the, and that sort of thing. But right now, this vision, I can't help but see this beast dad as one that relates to the Daniel beast. And the beast is not the Antichrist when we think of the person that's going to be called Messiah. The beast is the one behind him, right? This is the beast, this is the one responsible on a, if you see through to that other level, the level where the horsemen are, where the locust demons are, where the lamb looks like a lamb as, it had, as if it had been slain, and there's a seal in the hand of the one who sits on a throne. There's a beast that looks like a leopard and a bear and a lion and 
and has seven heads, that's who's making war with the saints. That's who's got a mouth speaking boastful things. That's who the world's going to wonder upon saying who can make war with him, not a man. So I think what we're looking for is this system. You know, we can already see, you know, I can tell you that's going to be this Islamic nation that's going to rise to their pinnacle of power. Who can make war with them? See, they're going to take over Jerusalem as both their prophecy demands or, or expects and as the, Jews, uh, as the Jews prophecy that their half-brother before their final redemption that they're going to have you know they'll be under the sway of their half-brother so you know this is and, and that turns out to be that seventh head the one that was wounded as of to death perhaps because the Roman Empire, the, the, the Islamic nation took it from the Roman Empire, apparently, just a couple of hundred years after Rome lost their Western Empire. The, the Moors took it from them in the Eastern Empire. Empire, Constantinople. And so, you know, from that point onward, it's it's been an Islamic, it, it was for a moment an Islamic Middle East. But that nation didn't last long. And yet, and, and yet it, when you look at it, it's been funded by the Roman Empire and so there's a way that I look at it dad in which the Roman Empire never did disappear and that's how this seven head might be construed as a head that was wounded but its deadly wound was healed this one that comes again this Muslim Empire takes over that land again and the whole world wonders and who can make war with them once they're all, once they've all come together? Everybody's all scared to death already out of a force nobody's even seen that they estimate a 30,000 that's pulled off a few false flag terrorist events around the world and the world shaken in its boots. Imagine if, you know, tens of millions of Muslims were all together under one caliph marching through Egypt, marching through Saudi Arabia threatening Turkey, threatening Russia. So anyway, uh, threatening Iran at that point. Who could stand if they were all under one flag, right? So anyway, it's just a different way of thinking about this. And we got some more exciting stuff coming up because we got uh, another wild beast coming up out of the earth with the two horns like a lamb. So we've got the false prophet coming next week. Anyway, thanks for sticking with me, guys. Sorry that I spent so much time ad-libbing, but I'm, I'm really trying to, to extract something a little bit, you know, get people to question and think about it a little different. So I appreciate your being here. God bless everybody. Love your neighbor. And uh, talk to you next week.